So we will start by looking at a particular case of optimal transport. But uh, first, let's put this particular case in the landscape of problems. So we want to find, we want to, as I said, transmogrify a source distribution into a sink distribution. And um, the source distribution could be discrete. So these are weighted Dirac impulses, in this case, in a one-dimensional feature space. Or it could be something continuous. And I've here written a probability mass function uh, to say that at a particular, if, if I interpret this as probability distributions, then a probability mass function is one which has a finite amount of probability at the given, uh, for a given realization of the random variable, whereas in the probability density function, uh, well, overall the thing integrates to one, but uh, each single realization has uh, a vanishingly small probability. And similarly, um, the sink or the target distribution can also be discrete or continuous. And now, well, we have these uh, cases. Um, there is uh, symmetry here. And essentially, if both source and target are discrete, this is the easy case, and that's the one we will start with. And you can also study the continuous case, which, however, is much harder computationally in general, except in simple cases where you can give closed form solutions to the optimal transport. All right, so we start with the discrete case. We have a discrete source distribution, like this, uh, these. Uh, the amounts are shown here of this distribution A, and then we have certain amounts that here I'm calling B. And we might have a transport cost defined between any, um, any of the, let's say, materials or items in A and any of the materials in B. Yeah. So for example, um, if I'm here interested in um, how expensive is it uh, to bring here the fourth kind of item to uh, the second kind of item well then i'm looking here at the fourth and the second so color coded here is the cost uh, and in this particular color map white would be high cost black would be zero cost and i've just created a random matrix here only to emphasize that really this transport matrix can have any um, structure. Uh, it is also, so here in this particular case, I have 10 source items and 10 sink items, uh, but also that not need, need not be the case in general. No? Um, I could have more source items than sink items, for example, in which case the transport cost matrix is no longer square, but rectangular. And uh, well, what we want to find out, um, so, you know, what is given? This thing here is given, um, my source distribution, my target distribution is given, and this transport cost matrix is given, and the transport plan is wanted. And the overall cost is given by the transport plan, so the matrix on the left, uh, element-wise product with the transport cost on the right. We get a new matrix with some overall entries, and that will be the, the total cost. Um, all right, I wanted to show how the problem can be set up as a network flow problem because, well, we had studied network flows. And if you now had to solve this, this is one particular strategy. And here I'm looking up um, the colors that I used. So what we can do is we can create a source we can create a sink 
And now we need to invent a network that will somehow express through the cost of its flow what the cost of a particular transportation plan is. Now, in these bins here, or what is shaped like a histogram here, is the information of how much material has to be transported. So we could, for example, look at this bin here, or we could look at that bin here. And um, when we were discussing the bin cost flow problem, we saw that edges can have capacities. Yeah? And uh, so I would now um, generate here plenty of nodes, one for each bin. And uh, capacity is an upper limit on the amount of flow, but actually in flow problems, I can also impose a lower limit on the flow. And the lower limit I would use here. Okay, now I have all 10. Um, the lower limit that I would use here is given by the height of the histogram bar. It's given by the amount of mass that I want to transport. And just in case I have negative costs, I can also impose upper limits. So on all these edges here, I would say that uh, the lower limit is the same thing as the upper limit is the same thing as the capacity. So that, Capacity is what we previously called in network flow problems, the maximum amount of flow that could go through an edge. And so I would now read off from the height of the histogram for each of these edges, what is the amount of stuff that must fly through there. So if I were to indicate this with the thickness of um, the these edges, then you know this would be have to be a thick edge because it needs to transport a lot of material. This one would be a little bit less, and those edges uh, on the left and right would be really thin because uh, there's only very little material that needs to be transported away. All right, so this is the material that needs to be uh, transported away. We can have a similar pattern, um, except I don't really want to draw quite as many nodes. Um, for the target. And uh, again here, we can do the same thing. We can have uh, edges and each edge has uh, a lower and an upper limit of the flow that it must transport. And this lower and upper limit would again be given by the amount of stuff that has to arrive. Okay, so um, in terms of a network flow problem, you know, we started with S, uh, we've now uh, done T, and what's needed is still the stuff in between. Okay, and this is uh, what we will fill in now. So um, the, f the flow from uh, one of the source items, um, it can go to any of the sink items. So we need extra edges here that all have a cost of zero. And they have no, they don't need any limits either. And for um, the target, well, it can collect incoming flow from all of the source items. So there would again be edges with a cost of zero and with no upper limit. Now, I would need to fill in the same kind of pattern for the whole matrix. And this would then give me my 
set up for a network flow problem. Yeah, so to draw it differently, um, let me try this one last time. I will do a source S, the target T. This time I'm drawing only three items and not 10 items. Um, and now because I have all combinations, um, I need to fill in all of these edges here. And the um, these edges here have a cost given by the transportation plan. So I previously said that um, the edges should have zero um, cost. Um, that's not perfectly true. So I either for the source edges, uh, now it's not perfectly true, it's wrong. So either for the source edges or for the sink edges, I need to um, charge this cost. Yeah? So uh, an equivalent representation here would be that um, I, and this is the one more akin to what I've used on the left is I have my source items. I have my sync items. And now I have enumerated all these different possibilities of connecting them. So this was the first connection, excuse me. Um, this was the second connection. This was the third connection and so on. And this is more similar to the picture that I've drawn on the left, except that on the left, I've used a matrix layout. And now we always have two edges. So I can, for example, say that uh, all the incoming edges have a cost of zero and all the outgoing edges have again uh, the cost um, sorry, hidden under my picture, you should have filled me. Um, this is the cost given by the transportation plan. All right. What I've also omitted here is the amount of required flow. Um, so those, this was the doubling of edges at the beginning and at the end. So the required flow would have been encoded in these edges here. And the required flow for the sink would have been on those extra edges. OK, um, I think I will stop explaining here because um, it's probably most efficient if you just think about it yourself um, rather than you know me explaining it another time. Um, so bottom line is, if the cost is given by amount of material transported times the cost of transporting, where the cost is encoded by such a matrix here, then this can be expressed as a min cost flow problem. Now, one particular case is this uh, case where the transport cost is not some uh, uh, does not have a very complicated structure, but where the transport cost um, simply depends on how far away a source and a target item are. Of course, this question of how far away are they only makes sense if the source distribution and the target distribution, if they live in the same metric space. And uh, if we then say that the cost is simply given by the Euclidean distance between a source item and a target item, um, then the cost matrix has this very simple structure. Um, but in either case, um, the kind of network flow setup that we showed here will be able to give you the optimal transport plan. So 
In this case, here the amount of flow is uh, shown in this matrix form and uh, tells us how much material is transported from one source item to one target item. Or for the same distributions, here is an alternative plot. Um, so we see that, um, for example, here um, in uh, this row, nothing is being transported. And um, so the way that uh, Vincent Hermann, from whom I've taken, from whose blog I've taken these really beautiful pictures, um, so the way he interprets it is that on the left is the source and on the top is the target. And here we have two little stuff. Um, so nothing is transported elsewhere, but stuff is only being brought in here, huh? which is why we have one row of zeros here, for example. And here is color coded where the stuff comes from and where, where it's going to. Good. Any questions so far? So we have seen that we can form it as a flow problem, but we have previously seen that min cost flow can be formulated as a linear programming problem. So it's not a big surprise that we can also write this as a linear programming problem. And perhaps this formulation perhaps is you know, more intuitive or, or clearer for many of you. So we want to minimize the sum of the products of the amount of stuff being transported, the flow, times the cost of transporting stuff between source items I and uh, target items J here. Uh, so we want to make this as small as possible under the requirement that indeed all of the source stuff does get transported away and that indeed um, the uh, target receives everything that it needs to receive. And this can be written uh, more succinctly or um, you know, emphasizing more the linear structure of the problem, perhaps, um, if we use this here, the inner product between a transportation plan and a cost matrix, um, where again we require where we have these normalization constraints. Um, this here is a this one subscript M is a column vector of ones, which has dimension M, so it is M ones. Uh, one underneath the other, okay? And uh, by, um, well, resizing these matrices P and C, we can also write it in the standard form of a linear program. Um, this is what we, we've seen before we did the Q&A session. Um, just at the time, we were minimizing over X, and we had written here at the time X transpose C, but of course, you know, these are just letters. So it's, it's the standard or the canonical form of a linear program that we have here. Now, min cost flows are only a subclass of linear programs. So it will generally be more efficient if you use a min cost flow solver than if you use a general linear programming solver, but you know, if, if that's what you have at hand, or if your problem is not too, too big, you don't care anyways, uh, you can just use a linear programming solver here. All right, and then I will say something um, that, uh, you know, will become interesting later. Um, in linear programming, we have a property um, called strong duality, um, which means that for each linear program, there is an associated linear program, and the, the solution of the so-called primal linear program is in fact identical to the solution of the dual linear program. 
by solution, I do not mean um, the vector p here, which uh, minimizes. Uh, I mean the value of the minimum itself. Yeah? So by solution, I now mean the p transpose c. Yeah? So my optimized variable times the cost vector. All right. Now, um, in this, uh, in these uh, dual linear programs, um, the cost vector c becomes a right hand side in the constraints, and vice versa. Um, what was previously the right hand side in the constraints becomes the new uh, cost vector that you see here. Yeah, so we have this duality. Um, also, the constraint matrix is uh, transposed. And um, so there is not a, not a very easy or very general geometric interpretation of this, because um, the optimization problems, they live in different dimensionalities in general. Yeah? So um, for example, here, if this matrix A uh, if the matrix A has dimensions n by m, um, then we would have an m-dimensional vector P that we are optimizing over. And here, well, A transpose would be m times n, so now we optimize over an n-dimensional vector f. Yeah? So we, we live in a different space. Uh, and yet um, there are, uh, it's, usually it's examples from economics. Uh, um, you can understand these dual programs in terms of uh, supply and need and prices and so on. So, so there are some uh, I would say somewhat intuitive uh, explanations for this duality, essentially from or especially from the economic realm. Okay, now this duality here it always holds. Yeah, so any this is just a canonical linear program, and for any linear program we can always write its dual. Um, more specifically, this um, linear program here we can rewrite as that dual linear program. You again see that the, um, here A and B was used in the constraints, and here A and B ends up in the linear objective. And this is an equation which we'll see again later today. For now, I'm, I'm just mentioning this. Okay, um, so Conclusion um, for the moment is that discrete optimal transport is just a specific case of a linear programming problem, um, even of a special linear programming problem, namely one that can be written as a min cost flow if we use the primal formulation. Um, hence, uh, standard solvers for either can be used, but the standard solvers, even the one for the min cost flow, can become too slow if we have very many observations. Uh, and then there are some things which are a nuisance occasionally. You remember that we discussed the geometry or the polyhedral geometry of linear programming and we saw that the feasible region of a linear program was always a, a polytope. Yeah? So a body that's bounded by half planes and uh, in a linear program, of course, we have uh, the cost vector. And I've shown a few, sorry, wrong button. Um, I've uh, shown a few cost vectors. Uh, I've shown a few cost vectors here. And uh, what I meant to, oh, but the colors are wrong. Uh, let's see, no, it's right. So um, in the green case, so if my cost vector points here, then the lowest cost edge that I can find is the one that I marked in green. 
Um, whereas if my cost increases in uh, that direction, the blue arrow, um, then the best solution is here. And if the cost vector, the orange one, is exactly orthogonal to one of the faces, then all of the solutions here on this orange face will have the same optimum value. Um, so in that sense, in this last sense, the solution can be ambiguous. That's what I wrote on the left. And the solution can be unstable in the sense that if I change the cost vector a little bit, um, the optimal transport plan can change sometimes even a lot. And that can be undesirable. Uh, moreover, if we want to do something with a deep neural network and use an optimal transport module as a post-processing, um, then we would ideally like to be able to train the whole system end-to-end. -end. So by sending in a gradient from the loss function through to the very beginning. And for that, we need every component in this pipeline to be differentiable. But here, um, the optimal solution, so the optimal transport plan, which I here called D star, um, depends on the cost matrix. And the cost matrix can depend on the parameters. So for example, the cost can be given by neural network with parameters theta. And uh, here in this linear programming formulation, it is not possible to differentiate directly the optimal solution with respect to the parameters of the neural network. And for deep learning, this is something that we would like. And uh, luckily, there is an algorithm which uh, finds approximate optimal transport and is faster than the standard linear programming solvers and network flow solvers for this case and is differentiable. And um, that's what we will discuss after a break.